Good evening. Welcome to Holy Trinity Anglican Church for Monday Thursday. Of course, if you're watching this, you're not actually at Holy Trinity Anglican Church as I am, but um, are watching it uh, probably in your living room or wherever you might be. Um, tonight, we would normally gather together uh, for uh, what is um, the first of three most important days in the Christian calendar. Um, Monday, Thursday, Good Friday, and then, of course, Easter Sunday. Monday, Thursday um, is a time where we recall our Lord's um, uh, issuing of a new commandment to us, that we love one another, and also his institution of um, the sacrament of Holy Eucharist or Holy Communion. Tonight, we can't gather together to celebrate that, and I'll tell more about why that is so as we as we, get, as we kind of go through what's going to be a lecture on the Holy Eucharist. It is a lecture, not a sermon, and as such, it, it um, has a different aim. It, it will be, I apologize in advance, a, a bit precise and a bit technical at times, although I'll try to do my very best to make it accessible as well. Uh, I urge you to think through these things and um, to, uh, to allow your minds to worship through... Um, through kind of a, an intellectual advancement and growth. I also thought it was important, since we cannot have Holy Communion, to learn about it. And as learning about it, that we might gather a, a deeper desire, a, a better understanding of what it is that, and, and how um, communion is so important in our lives and why it's so important. So that when we, um, when we do gather together, when that time is, is restored, We'll appreciate it at a greater depth. In the meantime, that our desire, our increased desire for the communion might become for us a spiritual sort of communion. So what I want to begin tonight doing is reading from the Book of Common Prayer in the preface for um, Maundy Thursday. The prayer book re it reads, Maundy Thursday receives its name from the, ma from the mandatum, a, a Latin word which means commandment, given by our Lord. A new commandment I give you, that you love one another just as I have loved you. You also are to love one another, from John 13, 34. At the Last Supper, Jesus washed his disciples' feet and commanded them to love and serve one another as he had done. This day commemorates the Lord's example of servant ministry, the institution of the Eucharist, the agony in the Garden of Gethsemane, and the betrayal leading to the crucifixion. And so we'll begin this evening with the collect for Monday Thursday. Almighty Father, whose most dear Son, on the night before he suffered, instituted the sacrament of his body and blood, mercifully grant that we may receive it in thankful remembrance of Jesus Christ, our Savior, who in these holy mysteries gives us a pledge of eternal life, who, and who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. And since we cannot receive it in the typical way, we're also going to, um, to uh, ask that the Lord would allow us to receive communion um, spiritually, that we would, um, we would receive a spiritual communion um, since we cannot receive it um, in, in actual form. Prayer 106 from the Book of Common Prayer. Dear Jesus, I believe that you are truly present in the Holy Sacrament. I love you above all things, and I, I desire to possess you within my soul. And since I cannot now receive you sacramentally, I beseech you to come spiritually into my heart. I unite myself to you, gathered together with all your faithful people, and I embrace with you all the affections of my soul. Never permit me to be separated from you. Amen. And so this evening, we are going to, um, to try something that I've never done before. Uh, we are trying to um, record both this lecture visually, but also interactively with, um, with a slide presentation that I have. And so bear with me. Um, hopefully, the technology will work most of the way, and we might have a little stumbling along the way. But I pray that this will be edifying to you and strengthening in your faith. And so with that, I am going to do a shared screen with my computer. And um, when that happens, we are going to move over here to this. And 
that. I'm going to move myself. Oh, excuse me. Um, I'll make it just a little bit bigger so that you can see me. Uh, hopefully, this will work. I'll move this kind of down to this corner here. Maybe a little too big. Okay. And then back over to here, and we'll play. And so here we are. Um, the Holy Eucharist, a teaching from Monday, Thursday, April the 9th, 2020. I would add also this is um, the Remembrance Day for Dietrich Bonhoeffer, a German pastor, uh, professor, and martyr uh, who was um, on this day executed by the Nazis in 1945. So let's begin with the origins of this meal. Uh, the meal that Jesus gave us. This is N.T. Wright's title that he uses in a little book that he wrote uh, called The Meal That Jesus Gave Us. I like it because it begins with the centrality of what it is that we're doing, that we are essentially gathering together to share a meal. And it is a meal that Jesus himself did give. But before even this was a meal um, that Christians celebrated, this was something that Jesus and his friends likely did quite a bit. Um, Jewish men during the time of Jesus often met in these societies. They were called um, kabura in Hebrew, or the plural kabura, um, uh, kaburoth, excuse me. The, the, they would meet together and, um, and have these, uh, these gatherings, these friendship groups. We have them today. Um, there's one in the Anglican, in Anglican world called the Brotherhood of St. Andrew. There are other groups um, in the Catholic Church, um, uh, Catholic women's societies, other societies of the sort. This is something that goes on. In fact, um, if you know anything about Methodism, Methodists were originally societies within the Church of England. They were Anglicans who wouldn't meet on Sundays at all, uh, not during Sunday um, time for worship. It would be Sunday evenings or, or Saturday afternoons or, or whatever. They were gatherings of like-minded people who wanted to study together and to be more devoted. It's a term then that simply means that. It's a gathering of friends and not a new religion, but an association within the religion. Um, so the Kabura is this gathering of friends that met together to be more devoted to the main religion, not to create a separate one. That's really important when you think about Jesus and his friends. If in fact, um, you know, they met at, and used these terms, this kabura, that they are that, the gathering of, of friends who want to be ever more devoted to, in his case, um, historic Judaism. And there would have been scores hundreds even, of these type of groups that gathered around Israel in the time of Jesus. It would have been very, very similar to his band of friends who, who met for, for, um, for study and that sort of thing. Um, the distinction, of course, with the Kabbalah of Jesus is that Jesus was very radical in his determination to be thoroughly historic figure of Israel, that he was wanting to, to be what Israel was always meant to be. And so even among the, the more devoted people of his day, he would speak to them about an even greater devotion, a, a, an even more radical adherence to historic Judaism. But Kabbalah would, um, this gathering of friends, would meet once a week for a, a shared meal. And, um, and they would meet during a, a, a time of... Um, of study, um, Dom Gregory Dix uh, says the corporate meeting, the, the Kabbara meeting, took the form of a weekly supper generally held on the eve of Sabbaths or holy days. So on the Sabbath, which would be Friday, begin at sundown on Friday, sundown on Thursday would be a time for these friends to gather. And, and as such is what we have historically in the Gospels. Uh, there's a little tension between John and the synoptics, and I won't get into that, but, but we could think of Jesus gathering with his friends on the evening before the Sabbath. The customs of the meals were well established. Um, the way that a, a, a Kabbalah meal, a weekly gathering, would go was the same everywhere. 
with every group. They did this uh, very similar sort of things. They would bring out what they called relishes, sort of what we would call hors d'oeuvres or you know, early bits of small foods that, that were gathering. And then there would be the blessing of the bread as the, the beginning of the main part of the meal. And the host would take the bread, he would take and bless and break and give this fourfold action that you see in the Last Supper, a, that you would see now to this day in, in the Eucharist. In, if you came to church on a Sunday and watched, the, the, that me as a priest, I would take and I would bless and I would break and I would give. This is what would happen in the meal. So Jesus goes through this fourfold action, takes, blesses, breaks, gives. And then at the end of the meal, there would be a, a second cup of wine, the cup of blessing. And that, that wine would be shared around the table. And then the, 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 the meeting would end, as it were, with a final benediction or blessing. As I said, the Last Supper follows precisely this Kabbalah pattern. It's exactly what one would expect. And so when you look at the meal that Jesus gave us, it begins with this membership meal, this fam, well, not family, but, but uh, friendship gathering, this like-minded, um, uh, equally devoted, um, common cause, if you will, type of meeting. And, and they gather for this, this purpose. And so one of the layers, and we're going to see that there are many layers to this, and I'm, I'm not exhaustive in all of them, but the, the critical ones, is the coming to this meal meant that you belong to the society. Sharing in the meal that you were part of this society, part of this group. It, members, it meant that you belonged. And so what we know is that the similar meal becomes altered. Jesus actually changes this meal. It undergoes a metamorphosis with him. Um, he altered the meaning of, of what his followers, what he knew would be his uh, ongoing pattern for his followers, that they would continue this Kabbalah gathering. But he wanted it to be different. He, he intentionally alters it. Because the breaking of bread, the thing, the taking, the blessing, the breaking, and the giving, are, something that would, are, are things that would happen in, in every home. Um, the only difference is the blessing of the cup. The second cup would not happen. The cup of blessing would not happen in every meal. It would, it would take place. And so if he did not alter the context, the Kabbalah could have changed from a member's meal to a private meal. It could have become something that people did in their homes. This is my body. This is my blood. But he doesn't. Because of the presence of the cup, because of the context of Kabbalah, he knew that this changed pattern would take place within that first circle, that membership circle. Uh, again, this is Dom Gregory Dix. It was the inclusion of the cup within the, new, within the new significance, which made of the Eucharist something which only the church could do. Jesus transformed this gathering but he left intact the, um, the parameters that cause the gathering. So it becomes evolved in a way that otherwise it would not have. I'm going to uh, reduce me here while we look at this, um, uh, if I can figure out how to get there. Bear with me just one second. I'm gonna exit this. I'm gonna come here and we'll move me just to talking. Put this up here and replay this. Okay, so this comes from Dom Gregory Dix, and he writes this, the Eucharist, or breaking of bread, is everywhere in the New Testament a rite for which Christians meet together, and which individual or fractional groups do not perform for themselves. This is, its, this is natural since by its origin, and in essence, a Kabbalah rite, something which is impossible outside of a corporate meeting of the society. This is really important right here. From the Jewish point of view, this rite actually constitutes the formal meetings of the society, and as such, and distinguishes them from casual or partial assemblies of its members. Again, for certain members of a Kabbalah, habitually to separate from the common supper, to hold a supper of their own, and especially habitually to offer the thanksgiving over a separate cup of blessing, 
would be in Jewish eyes to constitute a separate tabara. The rule that the essence of schism is breach of communion may be said to go back not merely to the origins of Eucharistic, Christian Eucharistic worship, but to actually behind it, excuse me, actually behind that into its Jewish prehistory. The Kabbalah Supper is thus emphatically a corporate occasion, which by rabbinical rule required at least three participants for its proper performance. And so we see that the Kabbalah, by definition, required a gathering together of the entire society, that one could not have a partial Kabbalah, because once that happened, it effectively would be to, to, um, to break with the other larger part of the, of the friendship community. So how Jesus changed the meal was by adding two specific remembrances and thus altering their meaning. And you know these right away, I'm sure. He, he takes the bread, blesses it, breaks it, and begins to give it to them, but says, this is my body. This is my body broken for you. This is my body given for you. And, and then he takes the cup and, it, and similarly um, allows, uh, it passes it, but says, it, it takes it, blesses it. Um, he says, this is my blood of the new covenant, which is given for you. In doing these two things and saying this, do this in remembrance of me, he has, as I said, maintained the context of the Kabbalah but transformed its meaning. He's transformed its meaning. Now, in Greek, there's this word remembrance, anamnesis. And all the, the writers of the New Testament would have used this word, anamnesis. Um, James White says this, I'm quoting Jesus, in my anamnesis, says James White, is an underscoring of this commemoration process. To remember, recall, know again, or experience anew. When Jesus says, do this in remembrance of me, he's not merely saying intellectually, stir up fond memories, recall the way that we might look at a photograph and then say, oh, remember how fun it was that year we went to the beach or whatever. No, what he's saying is, is um, relive this, redo this, reenact and, and, and remember these events as if they were happening at this very present moment. They continue into the present. So what about the early church? Um, what, and in what way did the early church um, see this meal? Um, well, the reinterpretation of Kabbalah suddenly means now that Gentiles can come in. It creates a context where it's not a Jewish only meal. Moreover, that the, the, the Gentiles who would have no interest in, in Jewish associations might find that they are, have a reason to be part of them now. And we know from the very earliest parts of the book of Acts that the Eucharist, the communion, was a central part. Now, I'm going to warn you, in this next couple of slides, we're going to get very technical. But if you'll bear with me just a moment, I think you'll see how important and why this, uh, the, the, the communion becomes an essential part of their gathering. In Acts 2.42, we have this passage. I'm going to go back into a, um, into a uh, speaker mode instead of a visual one. You can see already how complicated this, uh, this slide is going to get. <laughs> but we have this passage in Acts 2.42, and they, devote, they, the church, devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and the prayers. Similarly, in um, the New American Standard Translation, they were continually devoting themselves to apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. And the New Revised Standard, a very similar form. Now, this next one is going to look really weird, and you're going to say, wow, that's all Greek to me, because, in fact, it is. Um, here you have the, the Greek text from uh, Acts 2.42 in, um, in a, a, a modern um, Oh, critical translation or a critical um, copy. So here's the way it looks or would have looked similarly in, in the earliest parts of, of Luke's Greek. Now, I want to point out two things right here. First, this word hesan 
And, and then the second word, which means um, to devote oneself, uh, to give oneself to. Um, both of these have um, a, a present uh, active um, uh, feeling to them. It's an ongoing thing. Um, this first word, hey, son, third person plural, uh, active, imperfect, indicative, which means um, it, it's something that's an ongoing action. An example might be, you could say a similar sentence two different ways. Yesterday, I saw the boys ride their bikes down the street. I saw they rode, you know, past tense event. Or you might say it like this. Yesterday, I saw the boys riding their bikes down the street. There's a sense of an ongoing uh, event that's taking place. That's what's happening here. Um, this ongoing, this regular, continual action. And you'll notice in the New American Standard, they pick up on this while none of the other translators, very few of the other translations do, neither the English Standard Version or the New Revised Standard. They were continually devoting versus they devoted. Uh, it, it's a, it's a, uh, a minor point. Um, you don't, you know, weigh an entire translation on one word for sure. Uh, but you notice how the, the, the New American Standard picks up on the sense of the ongoing continual nature of what the church was doing. They were continually devoting themselves. Well, to what? what to what were they continually devoting themselves? Um, well, I wanna point out the comma because the comma in, um, in the, would not have been present in, in Luke's original. They would have been very uh, short on any sort of punctuation. Sentences just simply ran together, and the reader had to use um, understanding of subject, verb, and object in order to move from sentence to sentence. But you'll notice that the comma that was added to the, um, the critical translation shows up in all modern translations. That comma um, appears at, at, in modern English translations and uh, undoubtedly other language translations. Although I, I think it's an unfortunate insertion of a comma. And here's why. Um, what were they doing? Well, they were devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching. This is um, down here in the bottom and circled in purple, kai te koinonia, koinonia an important word that many Christians will recognize right away, and to the fellowship. But the word koinonia can also be communion. They, develop, they were devoting themselves continually to the apostles' teaching and the communion. To the breaking of bread. Notice again that how the comma separates those two um, items. The fellowship to the breaking of bread. And lastly, the prayers. So what we seemingly have coming out of here are four things, the apostles' teaching, fellowship, breaking of bread, and prayer. Um, I suggest that there's another way to look at this passage, and it is to highlight, notice the two bold words. It, they, they look almost um, exactly the same in English, chi. Uh, those, are the, um, those are actually Greek letters, but this is how you would divide a list of, of, of enumerated items in ancient Greek, because you didn't have commas. You would separate the items in a list by the word and, chi. Um, so you have, uh, you know, te didache, the teaching, uh, tone, apostolone of the apostles, chi, te quinonia, the communion, the breaking of the bread, chi, the prayers. Now, if you look at the, the American Standard, that's what they, they had. They were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fe to the fellowship, the breaking, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. I would do this this way. They were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching and to communion, that is the breaking of bread, and to prayer. Breaking of bread became a shorthand version, especially for Luke, in talking about Holy Communion. What we see then is not four things, but three. They were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching, that is, to the instruction from the Bible, and to communion, called the breaking of bread, and to prayer. And if you think about what makes the constituent elements of the Holy Eucharist, the service of Holy Eucharist, the Mass, these are the things that we have, don't we? We have Bible teaching, we have communion, and we have prayer. I'm going to 
bring myself back into this picture here again and uh, pop me down here at the bottom of the screen and we'll go back to the uh, other form here. But this is what we have. So in, in terms of the meal in the early church, um, it was a meal that was a meal for the baptized, a meal for the baptized that centered on, on biblical teaching, uh, on communion, and on prayer. But here's the thing. In the early church, the, during the, 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 um, the teaching part, all persons were welcome to come. Imagine in our church service, um, the, the way that the, the, the service is broken up by the, by the peace, by the passing of the peace. And so in the first half, you have a gathering where people come and, and we sing and there's this procession and, and then their scriptures are read. And then I preach a sermon and then we um, would say the creed and, and then there's a taking up an, uh, or the, the peace that comes before the, um, the offering. Now, it, some of those elements would not have been there. The creed would have, would have been held out. The, um, the, uh, the, the taking up of the offering would have been held back. But there would have been this break. The first half, the scripture and the teaching. And if you were not baptized, you would have been you know, thanked for your attendance, but then told that now would be the time for you to leave. And so the unbaptized would have to leave. They, would, um, they were not even permitted to stay and observe the part of the meal. And it was a meal. It was this meal where communicants believed that they shared in the very real body and blood of Christ. Again, probably it's going to be necessary for me to kind of jump out. Well, I, I think I'll just show you this from um, this first slide in, in English only. In, in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, St. Paul writes this about the Holy Communion. The cup of blessing that we bless, is it not a participation in the blood of Christ? The bread that we break, is it not a participation in the body of Christ? Because there is one bread, we who are many are one body, for we are all partake of one bread. Now, again, I'm going to back out here for just one second and, and disappear, and I'll, I'll come back in, uh, in here in a moment. But I want you to notice, in this is the, the below we have the Greek uh, text for, um, that would have been the original from the English. Notice the two um, semicolons. In, in ancient, uh, when, when they first began to make um, what called critical uh, text of the New Testament in Greek, they decided to use semicolons as question marks. Don't ask me why. This is what they did. Um, there are people who, in many different languages uh, who work together, and so they decided that the, co the code for a question mark is a semicolon. Uh, you can see in the first sentence in English, the cup of blessing that we bless, is it not a participation in the blood of Christ? That, that um, Christ right there uh, is the, the word with, in the lower part, just before the first semicolon, Christu. Big X is a, a CH sound. What looks like a P is an R, Christu. And then you see a second uh, semicolon highlighted there. Uh, this is the second question. Um, the bread that we break, is it not a participation in the blood of Christ? Okay. Now, I, I pull out this little page from, um, from a Greek grammar about questions. Um, all of these little uh, scratches of mine uh, are from way back when I was an undergrad student, but I, I thought it would be important for you to see this, so don't really pay so much attention to, to my scribblings as to the point that I'm trying to highlight. Um, note there are three ways to ask questions. One is no indication is given as to the answer expected by the speaker. You can give no, no indication. If the question is rhetorical, though, if it begins with ooh, that looks like an OU in English, the speaker expects an affirmative answer. Uh, teacher, not concern you that we are perishing. Um, uh, teacher, is it, not, is it a concern to you that we are perishing, isn't it? Uh, the way that the, 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 that's, that, that's a, a more literal one. Um, teacher, not concern you that we are perishing. Notice the semicolon, question mark. Yes, it should be a concern. We're dying here. Aren't you concerned? You should be. Uh, but look, if the question begins with may, that looks like, a, it sort of looks like a U. Now that's a, the, the, um, the M sound, m, and, and then the, um, what looks like to be an N is actually kind of has a long A sound. 
uh, if the question begins with may, the speaker expects a negative answer. Not, not all uh, apostles, are they? Um, not all are apostles, are they? Question mark. Answer, of course not. not. Not everyone's an apostle. So by the way that the writer asks the question, um, again, I'm going to pop out of here. By the way the writer asks the question, if you see um, this little ooh right here, expects an affirmative answer. If you see this little word, which is may, the writer expects um, a negative answer. And so, going back then in a moment, well, let's, let, me, let me go ahead and go to, this, to our next slide, um, which is, bear with me, right here. You see right here, the cup of blessing that we bless, is it not a participation in the blood of Christ? It goes right here. The cup, the, the one of blessing which we bless, uki, is it not, this word right here, koinonia, is it not koinonia? In to hematos, yeah, hema. Uh, when we get uh, hemat uh, he um, hematology, the study of blood, uh, the is it not a sharing in the blood of Christ? Notice the, the semicolon, which is a question mark. When you have the word ooh, it expects a positive answer. In other words, the writer is saying, "Is not the cup of blessing, Saint Paul, is not the cup of blessing with which we bless a sharing in the blood of Christ?" Answer: Yes, it is. Is not the bread which we break a share, a participation, a communion in the body of Christ? Answer, yes, it is. So let me bear with me just one more second while I kind of get back into to screen mode here. And so the meal in the early church was a meal that was um, a meal of sharing in the very body and blood of Christ. And it was important that this meal be inclusive of all the baptized. In other words, to exclude baptized members, while, we, while the meal intentionally excluded unbaptized, it on the other hand had an equal and opposite uh, uh, mandate for the baptized. That is, that the meal was expected for all the baptized. And we see this in the next chapter of St. Paul's first letter to the Corinthians. All the unbaptized have to be excused. All the baptized must be included. And we know this from the abuse of the, um, the Eucharist in the early church. Paul's first letter to the Corinthians was written to a church that was struggling mightily to live out its faith in a pagan world. They were people who were all former um, pagans. It wasn't a largely Jewish congregation. It was a largely uh, Gentile congregation. People who had been um, who had been formerly uh, worshippers of many gods. They had been polytheists, uh, people of of the land of Greece. And so, as they became Christian, undoing some of their their old practices quite difficult uh, for them to extract themselves from them. And one of them is in First Corinthians chapter eleven. Here's what happens. There's a situation where the church is gathering that seems to be a divide between rich and poor. That the rich are, are, are essentially saying that, um, you know, the church gathering will be, let's say, at 11. And they gather instead at 9. And they gather because they don't necessarily want to be with the others. Uh, this seems to be, um, for my reading of the text, what's going on. And so they get there early and they, they, the meal becomes, is a very, very much a meal, but it's, it's a, a Eucharistic meal. And so they, they have this uh, gathering where they eat all the bread and they drink all the wine. And when the poor arrive, there's nothing for them. Allow me to go back into talking mode here and, and, and show you this text. St. Paul says, but in the following instructions, I do not commend you. Because when you come together, it is not for better, but for the worse. For in the, in the first place, when you come together as a church, I hear that there are divisions among you. So this is what I'm talking about, the division, and I think, between rich and poor. And I believe it in part. For there must be factions among you in order that those who are genuine among you may be recognized. For when you come together, it is not the Lord's Supper that you eat. For in eating, each one goes ahead with his own meal. One goes hungry, another gets drunk. What? Do you not have houses to eat and drink in? 
or do you despise the church of God and humiliate those who have nothing? What shall I say to you? Shall I commend you in this? No, I will not. For I receive from the Lord what I also deliver to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was uh, betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he also took the cup. After supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Give me one second. And so the Eucharist, uh, where people were excluded who were Christians, Paul is, uh, condemns them for that. He says that that is essentially an abuse of the sacrament. That all the unbaptized must be excluded, but all the baptized must be included. And if one, if a church fails to do that, then they actually are poisoning the Eucharist. They are making the Eucharist become toxic. And he says to them quite plainly, oops, I Sorry about this. Um, there we go. Uh, he says to them quite plainly that um, that in in treating the Eucharist this way, they are bringing about damnation upon themselves. He some, some of you are sick, and some of you have died for this reason that God has judged the church for their inability to recognize the importance of inclusivity of all the baptized for the meal. And so we think about a second layer. Back earlier, kabura, membership identity. But then you have this sort of overlapping, this, this connecting, this spiritual bond that involves exclusion, exclusion and inclusion. That it is, a, it is important that, that members only be there, that membership identity, but also that something spiritual is going on. It is not simply just a meal. It is a meal with... Um, with a deeper uh, purpose and a deeper reality. Well, let's talk about the theology of the meal. So it, it, we're kind of moving ahead and, and reflecting then back on this meal, and we talk about it as a sacrament. What is a sacrament? The, the, our church has said a sacrament is an outward and visible sign of an inward and spiritual grace. God gives us the sign as a means by which we are to receive that grace, and is a tangible assurance that we do, in fact, receive it. So, there are two parts. There is the sign, the symbol, and then the grace. In the case of the Eucharist, you have bread and wine. This is the sign. And the grace, the, 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 the gift of God, the God's presence, his transforming power, come with it. And by receiving the sign, it assures us that we receive the grace that we know that it is part of our lives. The sacrament then refers to the, or the, the church then refers to these sacraments as a means of grace. And it is the liturgy, I think, that teaches us most clearly what it is that we believe. Here's what, the, what we say in, in the text. Um, Oh, what is so good? There we go. <laughs> we celebrate. This is a, it, this is a, a point where in the sac, in the, um, the, the, communion liturgy. You would see me place my hands down upon the bread and touching of the cup. And saying this, we celebrate the memorial of our redemption, O Father, in this sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving. And we offer you these gifts. Sanctify them by your word and Holy Spirit to be for your people, the body and blood of your son, Jesus Christ. Sanctify us also that we may worthily receive the sacrament and be made one body with him. Um, that he may dwell in us and we in him. Now, notice this, the, the words that we use, the words that I say. The, blessing upon, the, on the, the gifts of bread and wine. Why? So that they can be for your people, the body and blood of your son, Jesus Christ. Not like the body and blood of Christ, not remembrances of the body and blood of, your Christ, of, of Christ, but the very body and blood of Christ. This sacrament 
is a means of grace. It is the very body and blood of Jesus Christ. And it comes to us as a sure reminder and assurance of that grace that's given. It is to be the very body and blood of Christ. Um, so uh, once again, moving this little thing here. Um, so you have these three, this, this membership identity, this spiritual bond that we are all together, and this means of grace that comes to us. Uh, these are all part of the layers in which the, the communion becomes um, a communion to us. So... What about the effects? Our participation in Holy Communion assures us of our place in the life of the, of the church, that we belong. One of the reasons why I tell parents when their children are baptized and they, they bring this child to the altar rail for communion, um, well, before they could even receive communion, just infants in their arms, and then I would bless them, place my hand upon their head, pray that God would you know, mark them with the sign of the cross, that God would give them all the benefits of the Holy Communion. But then somewhere along the way, two years old, maybe, um, 18 months, I don't know, <laughs> two and a half, whatever it was for your child, that child begins to reach. They begin to reach for the communion. There was time when the church said no. And for a long span, no, we have to understand this communion. Well, as you'll be able to surely see by now, understanding it is very difficult. It's never been about understanding. It's been about believing. Are you baptized? Are you a member? And I say to the parents, when your child reaches for that communion, they're reaching for Jesus and that we give that child communion. I love the Orthodox tradition that a baby is baptized and then there's a spoon that they take in with the host on it, dip it in the wine and place it in that baby's mouth as, a, as an infant, a young child to commune. We belong the communion reminds us that we are part of the church. It creates a deepening bond of fellowship between one another. We, um, we are connected, as you do when you eat meals, right? Um, you uh, think about the first date that you ever have with somebody. What is it? It's usually a meal. At the very minimal, it's a cup of coffee, right? There's something. There's a, there's a bonding agent. And as you become more and more intimate with somebody, the, the, the meals are more and more important. And we continue throughout our entire lives, whether it's um, uh, in a, a romantic relationship or even in a familial relationship. What do families do? They gather together around the table and build bonds of friendship and love and camaraderie and solidarity and all those things. The communion also nourishes our inner life. With the presence of the living God, we are receiving the very body and blood of Christ into our being. And because of that, it nourishes us, it feeds us, it sustains us. In the same way that we eat food to keep our body going, the sacrament gives us spiritual nourishment to keep our soul alive. It offers a pledge of God's favor and forgiveness. It's a token and we do this. We, we understand these are the uh, tokens are part of the way we do things in everyday life. Um, I'm wearing a token right here uh, of marriage. Um, if I take this ring off, I'm still married. Honey, I promise I'm putting it right back on. If I take this ring off, I'm still married. The ring is not my marriage. The marriage is the union that God creates, the sacrament of holy matrimony. But the ring is a token. It's a reminder to me and to others that I, that I belong to someone, that I'm married. Um, a ring of, of ordination that I belong um, as a priest in the church. These are pledges. And the sacrament, the bread and the wine, is a pledge of God's favor and forgiveness that he welcomes us to his table. It works inwardly in us. Not only does it nourish us, but it gives us a deeper, deeper love for holiness and eschews, makes us to, to, to dislike evil. It makes us long for God and dislike evil in the world. It creates a, a, a love for God and for God's people. I want to pause for just one moment here, um, if you'll bear with me.
Oh, that's not the right one, not the right pause. Um, well, I'm not sure where what happened there. So back to where I was. It, it works inwardly in our spirit to help us um, to um, to love God, love goodness, and to shoot a shoot evil. Um, it it works inwardly um, to uh, to transform us as well. So as we as we begin to love God more, to long for goodness, to uh, to be repulsed by evil, we begin to look more and more not not look in terms of the way our appearances, but our lives begin to mimic the life of Christ in the world. And so here you have again this same um, thing, the overlapping. This is where the Eucharist. Uh, it meets us where we live. You have this, this coming together of all these different layers, and it's the central part of that membership and bond and means of grace that all come together in the communion. So what then are the minimal requirements? What are the minimal requirements for the meal? Well, the first thing is that they have to be the proper elements, bread and wine. Um, I have heard and read where people say these, uh, they're indifferent. It doesn't matter. You could do it with, um, with Doritos and soda pop or Oreos and milk. No, you can't. These are not the elements that Jesus instituted. He took bread and wine from a particular meal, from a particular sequence of, of items that were eaten. So it, there could have been other things that, that were part of the, as I said, relishes or whatever. No, he took bread and wine and only bread and wine. In our Anglican and Catholic and Orthodox worlds, um, it has to be fermented wine as well, which becomes a problem for some people who have a problem with alcohol. And they simply uh, avoid that by, um, by remembering that the body contains the blood. But they have to be these elements of bread and wine. There has to be proper invitation and proper, I think, polite exclusion. You heard me say it um, every Sunday, Christ our Lord invites to this his table all who love him, all who earnestly repent of their sins and seek to live in peace with their neighbor. We welcome all baptized Christians uh, to come to the table. Baptized Christians, and people have heard that. They have said to me, um, you know, I, I didn't come because I'm not baptized. And, uh, and I would say to them, well, would you like to consider baptism? And they say very much so, but most of the time when the person brings that, uh, that query to me, it's because they know that, that not being baptized means that they don't have a place at this meal, but they can. They can remedy that situation and become baptized and join in the meal. So all baptized are invited, all unbaptized are excluded. There's a proper presider, either a bishop or a presbyter, that is a priest in, in our tradition. Uh, can another person celebrate a valid sacrament? Um, maybe. I, 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 in our world, no, and I, not in this church. Uh, why? Why would we need a presbyter? Why would we need a bishop? Because these persons have been examined. They've been examined about their teaching. And so it protects the church against heresy if we keep the, the sacrament into the hands of those who have been examine and properly ordain. In our world, only a bishop or a presbyter, not even a deacon who has been examined, it has been ordained, but has not been ordained to, uh, to a role of presider. There needs to be a proper anamnesis, a proper remembrance. That is, Jesus says, oops, sorry about that. Jesus says, do this for the remembrance or in remembrance of me, the proper reliving. And we do that by recalling the very words. Uh, on the night that he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, Jesus took the cup. And again, he gave thanks to God, and he gave it to his disciples and said, Drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of the sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And then there's a proper distribution and communion that, that people actually come and receive. Um, that, they, that they actually 
commune it. They don't stick it in their pocket and take it out. Um, they, they commune and, and eat this very um, uh, real body and blood of Jesus. And they receive from the same meal. Think about this. We all receive from the same meal. I was trying to liken this in my mind to, um, I, I love to watch uh, cooking shows on television and, you know, maybe I'm watching Emeril and he's, he's making some fantastic pizza. And I could, in my kitchen, you know, watch and replicate what he was doing. But the pizza that I eat is not going to be the Emerald pizza. It's going to be Joe's pizza. It's going to be the, a different meal. It's going to be similar, but it's not going to be the same. Communicants receive from the same meal and even the sick who cannot come, we hold a bit back. We have leftovers. If Emeril would drive from his home or fly or whatever he did and show up on my doorstep and say, here, here's the pizza that I made. I saved some for you. That's what we do. We take the communion, the same communion to the sick. We do not recreate a communion in their midst. Um, it's me generally who takes it, but uh, deacons can take this. Why? Because we're not making a new communion. They are eating from the same meal. So I saw this this week on, um, on the internet, um, uh, many of my friends in discussion groups. This one is from Christianity Today, a, a solid magazine, a, um, a really good uh, evangelical Protestant um, you know, magazine that writes on many subjects. That, and I think, by and large, does a really good job. But they have this article, online communion can still be sacramental. Well, maybe it can be sacramental, but it's not the sacrament. Um, can we have Eucharist during quarantine? Well, I think you have to ask yourself the questions. Can we have proper elements, bread and wine? Well, you know, I've been an Anglican for a long time. And I think that virtually all of you probably have these two elements somewhere in your home. If not, they're very easy, easily accessible. We have bread, we have wine. Can we have a proper invitation and exclusion? Hmm. Can we invite all the baptized? I'm not sure that that's really a possibility. Are all the baptized or are the unbaptized excluded? Well, yeah. Is there a proper presider, that is, a bishop or a presbyter? Well, in most of our homes, the answer is no to that. Um, in, in, um, I'm going to see if I can, just one moment here. I cannot. Forgive me for that um, bit of... Uh, Confusion here, <laughs> back up there. Do we have a, a proper bishop or presbyter? Is there a proper anamnesis, a remembrance? Uh, do this in remembrance of me? Well, perhaps a distribution and communion um, in our homes, perhaps. But if I was to celebrate the communion here and you were to watch and eat of elements in your own home, are those received from the same meal? The answer, of course, is no. Can the sick receive from the same meal? Again, the answer is no. Um, uh, bear with me one second. Can I call you right back? Yes, can I call you right back? <laughs> I knew there was a way to pause this message, and I can't find it now, and my kid keeps calling me, so... <laughs> uh, um, it, Back to our, our thing. So can uh, communicants receive the same meal if I celebrated here and you ate of the elements of your home? No, we could not do that. Well, why do Protestants allow for a, um, a, a meal? I'm going to show you this picture of this fellow. Um, his name is Ulrich Zwingli. Ulrich Zwingli, uh, Ulrich Zwingli is, was a reformer in the 16th century, a, a scholar, um, a... Um, a, a person who uh, who was helping the church in um, in its Reformation period, um, Zwingli taught this that communion is only a meal. The elements have no change to them at all. So it's not the body and blood of Christ, but it reminds us of the body and blood of Christ. Its value then is a value of mental recollection. It call it causes one as one eats this meal to remember 
Jesus, to have fond memories. And so Protestant communion, it might be a communion, it might be sacramental, but it is not the sacrament of the Eucharist because it does not contain all the elements. Elements can be substituted. Uh, bread and wine can become other things. Ordination is not required. The consecration lacks an epiclesis, a belief that, that we're calling down upon these very elements, the, the um, Holy Spirit. And so for Catholic Christians, that is Anglican, Roman, um, Eastern Orthodox, it does not contain all the necessary constituent parts to be a sacrament. And so the reason why Protestants can have communion is because of what they believe about communion that it is not a sharing in the very real presence of Christ. Uh, so their communion, um, and, and you know, I, I don't mean to, um, to deprecate it at all. I don't mean to say that, uh, that ours is better, that ours is different. What we believe is different. And because of what we believe, the, the bridging of the gap in terms of um, electronic uh, distance simply cannot happen. So we cannot have a Eucharist during quarantine. If I had a Eucharist, it would have to be this. Open doors, all the baptized are welcome, who wish to come. Um, I couldn't, you know, even if I celebrated a Eucharist, a, a minimum requirement of three people, uh, if I celebrated a Eucharist here, and there were th only three people, and I delivered it to everybody, it would still be a sense in which we were breaking um, with uh, what our, our church and our government have asked us to do. So the question is, well, isn't it an extremist? I mean, isn't this the most extreme example, a, a life and death issue? Um, can't we make exceptions? Others are making exceptions. We could have bread and wine. We could remember Jesus. We could have a similar experience, but we cannot have Eucharist. And there's a real danger in allowing a substitute Eucharist because a substitute Eucharist can easily become a new Eucharist. It can become a different Eucharist. It could change the teaching of the church and the belief of the church. And, and because we are in such desperate need for a sacrament now, it might cause us to lose a sacrament altogether later. And so that's why this is such a, a, a serious issue. And I say here that humility has to bow to providence. I think one of the real struggles that we have here is that we are not used to being told no. We're not being used to being told no um, in, in business, in commerce, in life. Um, even little children, you know, very young are told no. They, they throw temper tantrums and they stomp and they, they, they are frustrated and angry and and they, they do what children do. And we do it now. I hate to admit this. I was on the phone the other day with, um, with an internet service provider. I won't say which one. Um, but I was on the phone with an internet service provider who happens to also provide other services. And, and I called and I told them I was having a problem with my modem. Um, the person said, I'm not the right person to ask. You'll have to hold for the next person, and they, I'll send you right over there. So they send me to somebody else. That person, within a minute, said, I'm sorry, I'm not the right person. I'll have to send you to somebody else. I'm not kidding. That person said, I'm sorry, I'm not the right person. You'll have to speak to someone else. And I said to this person, I've been on hold now for, for at that point, um, 40 minutes, and um, and nobody seems to be able to help me. I, I need you to help me. And she said, I promise, I've never had anybody come back from this person. And so they send me from this department to a next department. By the time somebody got on the phone, it was over 45 minutes. And I said, you know, um, I need this, uh, you know, I need a new motive. And they said, oh, I'm sorry, I have to send you to this person. I said, well, that's the person that just you sent me to you. And they said, well, I'm sorry, but that's what you have to do. And I'm sorry, I said, can I just speak to your supervisor? I need... I, I need some sort of remedy for this. No, you can't speak to my supervisor. I said, well, I need to speak to somebody. I don't want to go back to the person who already told me no. And they hung up on me. <laughs> this person hung up on me. I spent 45 minutes on hold only to get no and then to be hung up on. Well, I called a different internet service provider and so we're going to change companies. 
my point is it was really frustrating. We're not used to that. We, we, don't, we don't deal well with those sorts of things. And so here we are in a situation where we can't have something that we want. It's something that's good. It's something that, um, that's holy and righteous and all this. And, and we say, surely there must be a way. It is Almighty God who has limited us here. He knows the constituent elements required for a Eucharist. It's not simply a fact that the church has said no. It is God in his wisdom has said no, has pulled it back from us has allowed us to go for a moment of, of anguish and soul searching. And I'm saying it's time to be humble, to understand that humility is what's required. God says no, no is the answer. But are we without grace? Are we without God's presence? No. We seek God in other places. We become people of the book. And you know, this should be um, people of... Um, the book, capital B, <laughs> um, that we are people of the book, not just uh, people of the sacrament. We're people, oh my word, uh, we're people of the book. We come together around scripture. This is what Israel had to do. They had a similar issue. For them, the presence of God wasn't in a meal. It was in a building in the temple in Jerusalem. And when it was destroyed, it was if the whole world had lost a Eucharist and would never get it back until that building came back. And what did they do? They became people of the book. They began building synagogues, gathering places where they could get together and read scripture. We can become people of the book. And I'm just going to be honest. We need it. We need to become people of the book. We need to become more serious about our study of scripture more literate in the Bible. And in this way, maybe in God's goodness, he has helped us by taking away the Eucharist for a time. We can be people of common prayer, learning to pray together more regularly. Oh my, hasn't this done that? I see, you know, people who, who join me for morning prayer and evening prayer in the hundreds, in the hundreds. And those are, those are just people who are, um, uh, you know, individual units. It might be families that are gathered. I know there are many families that are gathered around the TV to, to, to pray together. We can be people who serve. Maundy Thursday is a remembrance that Christ came to serve. And he gave us an example as he washed his disciples' feet that we ought to be people who serve. And we can find God in our service. What does Jesus say in Matthew 25? Whenever you do it to one of the least of these, my brothers, you do it to me. When you clothe the naked, when you feed the hungry, when you visit the prisoners, when you, uh, when you serve people in need, you, are, you serve me. And we are ultimately people who can find God in the desert. That we can pull back from community. We can be extricated from everything and realize that God cannot be hidden. 139th Psalm, if I go to the highest mountain, you are there. If I find myself in the depths of the sea, you are there. In the very uh, uh, inner, inner part of Sheol, of, of the depths of the, of, of the dead, there you are there as well. That we can find God in ways, not as a, an, an alternative, not that we no longer will need the Eucharist, but this will be ways in which we can grow and develop our souls and become more like Jesus in this world. And so these are the, um, the, the elements that I wanted to bring to you about Holy Communion. Oh, how I long to ce celebrate it with you and to, to feast. I, I can only imagine what that's going to be like. Uh, in the meantime, I suffer with you. Um, I wouldn't use uh, a position of privilege of right as a presider to, to have a communion without you. Uh, I, don't want, um, I, don't, I don't want anything that, that you can have, that, that we can't have a, an inclusive gathering. And so I won't. Um, and I can't, really. It, it would be as improper in my understanding as it would be um, for a, a layperson to do so in their home. Know that I love you, that I pray for you daily. I look forward to seeing you. Tomorrow, we'll be doing the Stations of the Cross, and I invite you to join us at 7 p.m. for those. Until then, know that, um, that you're in my prayers, and I wish you the very best. God bless you.
Good night.